It's time for us to begin our Bible class this morning. We have several that are in the parking lot this morning, and appreciate their being here, as well as those that are online. Uh, we're going to be continuing our study in the big picture, and we're going to be talking about the epistles in our study here beginning this morning. But before we get started, we want to go to God and work the prayers. So please bow with me as we pray to God this day. Our wonderful God and our Father in Heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to come together and to open up our Bibles and study. We pray, Father, that as we enter into our period of study that the cares and concerns and distractions of life can be placed aside. That we focus upon Thee and upon Thy Word and how we can learn to better serve Thee. We gain a deeper appreciation for the life that uh, your New Testament Christians live, the problems they endured. We pray, Father, that we be inspired to be more dedicated in thy service, but more faithful to thee. We pray, Father, at this time for forgiveness of our sins. We recognize we don't deserve that forgiveness. We recognize, Father, that it's only by thy mercy and love and grace that it has been provided for us. We pray, Father, to help us to choose the way of escape from temptation in the future. Help us, Father, to help one another to live in such a way that heaven can be our home, to encourage one another, and to help one another to live faithful lives. We pray, Father, that you would be with us as we continue through this Bible class. You'd continue with us through the remainder of our worship today. And we pray, Father, that your name would be honored and glorified in all that we do. For this is our prayer in your Son's blessed and holy name. Amen. We are in a discussion of the letters of the New Testament church. Now, obviously, as we've emphasized in every uh, lesson, we're getting a bird's eye view of these. How many, how many epistles are there in the New Testament? How many books of the New Testament are there? There are 27 books in the New Testament. How many of those books are not epistles? Are not classified as epistles? Really, well, you've really got the, the Gospels, that's four. The book of Acts is five. And the book of Revelation is generally considered a different sort of uh, material. Even though in, in many ways it still is an epistle that was written to the seven churches in Asia, it's considered apocalyptic literature. So if we take that 27 and we subtract, what, six. How many epistles are there? There's 21 epistles. And so we're going to cover 21 epistles in... Uh, two class periods, approximately 40 to 45 minutes apiece. So that means if, if we divide that by a pistol, we're going to be able to spend about four minutes on each pistol or so. So we're obviously getting a bird's eye, a bird's eye view of these epistles. Who wrote the majority of those epistles of the 21? The Apostle Paul. How many did he write? 13 or 14. It really depends on how we put the book of Hebrews. It is an anonymous epistle. I personally believe, if somebody's asking me my personal belief, I think I can make a pretty compelling case for Paul being the author of the Hebrew epistle, but there are good brethren that disagree with that. So we'll say 13, possibly 14 epistles written by the Apostle Paul. What are the value of these epistles or letters? That's what an epistle is. It's just a letter that was written to, the, to churches or individuals. What is the value of these epistles? They're instructions. Uh, a great majority of what we know about Christian living, uh, about the, the worship of the church, it is contained in this instruction that was written to churches or to individuals. Uh, for example, instruction about the Lord's Supper, First Corinthians chapter 11. We learn a great deal about it, how to partake of it and, uh, and uh, some of the abuses that they took of it. We talk about singing and worship, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. A great deal of what we learn about Christian living, our responsibilities toward one another, to control the tongue, to express brotherly love. So a, a good portion, perhaps the vast majority of instruction that is contained in the New Testament is contained in what we call the epistles or these letters that were, that were written to Christians. We're going to divide them up into two categories. We're going to this morning talk primarily about the letters of the Apostle Paul try to get a bird's eye view of those, place them in the proper place. Then we're going to come back on Wednesday night and we're going to talk about the epistles that were written by other people. That would be Peter and John, Jude and, and James, and place them in their proper place 
in the biblical story. Let's just begin, and this is somewhat like the chart that you have. I put some information on the chart that you have in your book about the, the writings of the Apostle Paul. We have the letters over here when they were written, at least in terms of where they fit in the biblical story, and then the date given, and then who was the recipient of those. I think it's really valuable to be able to place the epistles of Paul in their proper place, particularly in the book of Acts, when possible. And that helps us to appreciate uh, the context in which Paul wrote that and the situation that existed. In the very first epistle written by the Apostle Paul was the epistle to the brethren at Galatia. Well, what's one thing that's unique about the book of Galatians in terms of who it's addressed to? It's written to what? To churches as opposed to the church. The book of Rome, the, the epistle of Romans may have been written to more than one local church in the city of Rome. Uh, but it, it's obvious that the book of Galatians is written to the churches of Galatia, not the church at Ephesus, but the church at Corinth. So it was written to a number of churches in the area of South Galatia. There are some that hold to the North Galatia view, but the evidence is for South Galatian uh, recipient of that. It would have been written from Antioch of Syria probably sometime after the first missionary journey. So, if we were writing in the margin of my Bible when this was written, and I typically do that, we've got the first missionary journey that is taking place in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter uh, 14, and then you've got the Jerusalem conference, and so I would probably just mark somewhere at the end of chapter 14 and before chapter 15, that's probably about when the book of Galatians would have been, been written. Uh, what's the message of Galatians? Two things about Galatians you need to remember. What are they? Let me ask this question. What larger epistle is Galatians a lot like? Romans. In fact, some have called Galatians a Romans in miniature. If you, if you look at it this way, if, if Romans is Paul's thesis on justification by faith, Galatians is Paul's essay. Okay, it, it's, it's a much briefer uh, message than Romans. He doesn't uh, argue that point at length, but ultimately the same point is made. We're justified by faith apart from the law. And then the second thing is Paul's purpose in writing was to defend his apostleship. That's why he begins the epistle. Paul was an apostle not of what? Of men or of through men, but what? Through Jesus Christ. And so two things about Galatians you need to remember. Number one, justification by faith. And number two, defense of Paul's apostleship. How many chapters in the book of Galatians? Six. Remember this outline. Chapters 1 and verse 2, the gospel's origination, where it came from. Not from men or through men, but what? <laughs> through God, the gospel's origination. Chapters 3 and chapter 4, the gospel's what? Vindication, as he contrasts that with the old law, justified by faith, not by law. And chapters 5 and verse 6, the gospel's application, how it affects our daily life. So, Three main points. Here's what my approach to, to books like Galatians is, or really all of the epistles, okay? You're not going to memorize every verse of every chapter. You're probably not going to ever, ever memorize every chapter, right? You're just not going to do it. If you can remember and break it down into something that's just simple to understand, then you can recall that later on. You can just memorize the Gospels' origination, chapters 1 and 2, the Gospels' Vindication, chapters 3 and 4, and then the Gospels application, and uh, chapters 5 and verse 6. I'll have all this written down for you uh, later on when we get all those things written down. So, at some time after the book of Galatians, during the second missionary journey, Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians. That takes place during the second missionary journey. Uh, the second missionary journey, of course, in the book of Acts begins in Acts chapter 16 and continues through Acts chapter 18. But 1 Thessalonians would have been written sometime during the 18th chapter of the book of Acts, as well as the, uh, the second epistle as well. The church is established in chapter 17. And here's one reason that's valuable. The church begins in Acts 17, right? 
So the epistle of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians is written in chapter 18. What does that tell you about the church of Thessalonica? At this point in time. It's not very old. It, it's, sometimes I refer to it as an infant church. It, it, it's still very young. The church may not have been in existence, but six months to a year at the time Paul writes 1 and 2 Thessalonians. It does a couple of things for me. Number one, it impresses me, okay? It, it really impresses me when I'm reading through 1 Thessalonians and he's talking about the gospel going forth from them and to all the world. And he's talking about their work of faith, their labor of love. That tells me these people hit the ground running. You know, that they're new converts, they're relatively new Christians, and yet they are extremely dedicated to serving God. They're doing the very best they can to grow spiritually. It also helps me to appreciate the fact that some of these deficiencies that they have are probably understandable. In other words, they have questions about the second coming of Christ. What's going to happen when the Lord returns? Well, they haven't been Christians all that long. So some of those questions they have may be understandable. So 1 Thessalonians is written when the church is young, somewhere around A.D. 51. One thing to remember about the, 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 the uh, first epistle of Thessalonians. It's about behavior in light of the second coming of Christ. That's really what it's about. How do we behave in light of the Lord's coming? Here's the one thing I want you to remember about 1 Thessalonians. Every single chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with what? Anybody know? A mention of the coming of Christ. So that helps you appreciate the overall thing. You got your Bibles open there, First Thessalonians. Let me show you this. Okay, First Thessalonians chapter one, verse ten. We are to wait for His Son from heaven, whom God whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Okay, so it talks about the coming of Christ. Chapter two. We're in chapter two, in verse eighteen through verse twenty. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at His coming? For we are our glory and joy. End of chapter 3 and verse, uh, verse 13. That He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 4, beginning in verse 13 through verse 18, there's that full discussion of what happens when the Lord returns. Those, he hadn't forgot about those that are alive, but they're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And then over in chapter 5, the last instruction he gives in verse 23 is that your whole body, spirit, your whole spirit, soul, and body may be are blameless, what? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, at least in terms of how we have it divided in our English Bible, every single chapter, every instruction given ultimately ties back to the fact Jesus Christ is coming. Okay. He's coming again. Get ready. Live in light of that coming. Now, when you appreciate the fact that that's what 1 Thessalonians is about. Paul says, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Be prepared for that. You appreciate a little bit more why 2 Thessalonians is necessary. Just a few months later on, because apparently there were some at Thessalonica that misunderstood Paul's instruction and they thought what Paul means is what? Jesus is coming right now. Now, as I've said before, let me ask you this question. If you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, you knew Jesus was coming at the end of next week, how many of you are getting up and going to work in the morning? I mean, you're probably going to think, what? Not much sense in it, is it? You know, if the end of time is coming, if the Lord is going to return, I'm staying home. Or I'm going to be sure that I, I'm, I don't want to devote myself to prayer. I don't want to devote myself to study. But if the Lord is coming quickly... I'm not going about my normal activities. Those who take a, a back seat. That's what happened at Thessalonica. And so as a result of that, what were they doing? They were quit, quitting their jobs. And they weren't staying busy. Now, you know, as humans, we're going to fill our time with something. Okay? You know, if you're not working, you're going to be doing something. In our day and time, we may be wasting time on social media. We may be, we may be you know, yeah, fishing, hunting. We may be just, we're going to do something, right? We're not going to sit around and do nothing. What were they spending their time doing? Anybody know? They were busy bodies. They were sticking their nose where it didn't belong. They're being busy bodies, not people's minds. So that's what prompts Second Thessalonians. And really, if I had to assign a thing to Second Thessalonians, it would be this. The Lord is coming, but not yet. Okay. That's your message. 
message of 2 Thessalonians. The Lord is coming, but not yet. In fact, the falling away is going to take place for a three-point outline of 2 uh, uh, Thessalonians. Number one, commendation. And if you can connect these, it helps remember. Commendation, chapter one. He commends them for their faith. Chapter two, after the commendation, is the correction in chapter two concerning any misunderstanding that they may have had. And number three, uh, chapter three, the command to withdraw from the disorder. So you've got the commendation, the correction, and the command in 2 Thessalonians. Any questions about that? The next epistle Paul writes is 1 Corinthians. It's written during his third journey, sometime probably around the spring of AD 57. We just had to talk about this one on, on Tuesday morning. It was probably written from Ephesus, or it was written from Ephesus. So in Acts 19, in the margin of Bible, somewhere uh, while Paul is in Ephesus, you, you can mark in the margin of Bible, he wrote to Paul. And he wrote to Corinthians. Uh, what's the book of 1 Corinthians about? Come on, tell me it's theme. There are what? Contentions among them. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 11, that is your key verse in that chapter, or in that book. There are contentions among you. Um, remember this, you outline the book by the problems that are being dealt with. Okay. Um, Chapters 1 through chapter 4, you've got division over preachers. Who's your favorite preacher? Paul, Paulus, uh, and Paul is writing and saying, preachers are just what? We're just servants. We're stewards. Uh, don't think a man beyond that which is what? Written. Okay. Don't follow men beyond the Word of God. Chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, the division over preachers. Chapter 5 is what? The problem of immorality. Chapter 6, Going to longest brother. Chapter 7, questions about marriage. 8, 9, and 10, proper use of liberty. Speaking this case immediately, chapter 11, headship and the Lord's Supper. 12, 13, 14, spiritual gifts. And the questions about spiritual gifts. Chapter 15, resurrection. Chapter 16, the collection of the saints and the closing remarks. So, uh, again, it's pretty easy to remember. Remember, you're trying to remember a problem. What problem has? Okay. What, what issue are they dealing, dealing with? And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about. It's about the problems that are dealing with in Corinth and, and, and giving the instructions to, to correct those problems. Sometimes later, maybe about six months later or so, the Apostle Paul writes 2 Corinthians. The book of 2 Corinthians, and we're studying that on Tuesday morning right now, the book of 2 Corinthians is written, and really there are, there are three main reasons that the book of 2 Corinthians is written. Somebody tell me what those reasons are. What's one reason 2 Corinthians is written? We have to receive first Corinthians. Do what? Receive. Basically see how they receive first Corinthians. Uh, see if the, uh, the changes they had. Uh, they put, like, that is one reason that it is written. Uh, the three reasons I always remember, number one, to make the point that God gives us all the comfort we need to accomplish it. That's really what the first um, seven chapters are about. God gives us all that we need, all that we need to, to, to receive the comfort and instruction in order to do His to do His will. Number two, to encourage the giving of the son, uh, for the needy saints in Jerusalem. And the third is a defense of Paul's apostleship. So we we can't as easily remember all of those chapters in Second Corinthians. We could go through those if we wanted to. But basically, a three point outline on 2 Corinthians. Chapters 1 through chapter 7, God is the, uh, uh, is, is the uh, explanation or the, the fact that God is a God of all comfort. Chapters 1 through 7. Uh, chapters 8 and 9, the giving for the needy saints. 8 and 9, and then the defense of Paul's apostleship in 10 and 13. Or if you want to remember it this way, I don't know where this outline originated. You've got chapters 1 through 7. Somebody said it's explanation. Chapters 8 and 9 is encouragement to give. And 10 to 13 is enforcement of apostolic authority. But that's what 2 Corinthians is about. Three reasons that it was written. Book of Romans. Book of Romans was written on the third day journey, chapter, uh, about AD 57. It was written from Corinth in Acts chapter 20. And here's one reason I like to know that. Um, in Acts chapter 20, 
where Paul is at Corinth and he's writing to the brethren at Rome, that's where Romans 1 is written from. So when Romans 1 starts describing um, the homosexuality, the idolatry, the disobedience, when, when it describes just how terrible the Gentile world was, guess where he was? He was at Corinth. Corinth was just sort of known for its immorality. Being a Corinthian girl was the same as being a prostitute. They had a thousand prostitutes to serve daily in the temple of Aphrodite. So that's where Paul was when he wrote Romans. And he wrote that description in Romans chapter 1. Uh, the book of Romans, what's the theme to Romans? We mentioned it earlier. Justification by, by faith. Uh, what's the key verse of the book of Romans that you need to memorize? Two verses, really. Romans 1, 15, 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So that's the thing. The just shall live by faith. That's the message of, of the book of Romans. Um, you, you can outline the book of Romans uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, it is uh, considered, I will say this, when we talk about the writings of the Apostle Paul, do you, you remember the Apostle Peter said that some writings of the Apostle Paul are hard to understand. Uh, that's over in 2 Peter chapter uh, 3. Most of Paul's writings are pretty straightforward. It, it's not like the apocalyptic literature of Revelation. But I don't know that I've ever seen a Bible class where somebody made a comment on 2 Peter chapter 3 and some of Paul's writings being hard to understand that somebody did say, I bet Peter had in mind Romans. That's probably the deepest and the most difficult of the epistles of the Apostle Paul. It, it, it is not as difficult as Revelation. It is not a popular, but there are some hard sections that are found in the book of Romans. Very broad outline, and almost all of Paul's writings follow a broad outline, sort of like this. You've got your argumentative section or your doctrinal section followed by an application section. Paul almost always follows that basic outline. Now, sometimes like on Galatians, we divide it down into three sections. But most of the time, Paul will begin by making his doctrinal point. And he'll argue that at great length. And then he ends by saying, now here's what that means, okay, in terms of your daily life. One reason I believe, you can describe it, one reason I believe Hebrew is written by the Apostle Paul is it follows that basic outline. It follows the outline of chapters 1 through chapter 10 is a large argumentative section where the Hebrew writer is arguing that God, that Christ is superior to anything you compare him to. Then he says, now what does that mean? And in, in chapter, uh, the latter half of chapter 10 through chapter 13, he goes through the practical application that it means we assemble together. It means we encourage one another. It means that we show hospitality. In other words, if we're, if we're living like Christ is superior, here's what that means. That's Paul's basic outline of everything that he writes. So, in, in, in Romans, Romans 1 through 11 is that argumentative doctrinal section where Paul points out, Romans 1, uh, the Gentiles need the gospel, chapter 2, the Jews need the gospel, chapter 3, we all need the gospel, we're justified by faith in chapter 4 and 5, we can't continue in sin in chapter 6, we die to the law in chapter 7. Uh, chapter 8 uh, talks about we're free from the law of sin and death because of what Christ did for us. 9, 10, and 11 talk about the Jews in particular. They are lost because they rejected the gospel, but God has not completely cast them off. There's still hope of those turning the Lord. Then again, chapter 12 through 15 is that application section. Any questions on Romans? On that kind of Got all that down? That's all we feel on the final. Mm -hmm. So. All right, book of Ephesians. Written here in Paul's first letter. These are easy to remember. How many prison epistles are there? Four. Yeah. What are they? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are your, are your prison epistles. They were all written about the same time in 62 and 63 uh, A.D. So in my Bible, I get that last two verses of the book of Acts where it has Paul was in prison. I write out beside that, but Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I think, what did that tell you about Paul, by the way, during this time? You know, Paul could have gotten in prison in Rome and said, well, that's not fair, I'm here and I didn't do anything, and 
What you know? What what value can I be stuck in a prison somewhere? Instead, what did Paul do? He wrote letters. You know, he wrote letters. He he instructed. He continued to teach. You think about the invaluable material that we have produced at the hands of the Apostle Paul uh, during that period uh, period of time. You know, some, sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where you know we, we can't do what we want to do. Maybe somebody's not older. You know, they're, they're, that they can't uh, do some of the things they used to do. Maybe there's infirmities. Maybe there's sickness that affects us. And sometimes we can use that as an excuse and say, "Well, I just can't do it." And suppose to the Apostle Paul that maybe we ought to be saying, "What? What can I do? Can you write letters of encouragement?" Now, I'm not, not all the ones the Apostle Paul has inspired material, but I mean, are there things you can do? Are there things we can do that help us? Can we pick up a phone and call people? There are always things we can do, like the Apostle Paul. But he'd be asking when we're in difficult circumstances and situations, "I may not be able to do everything I want to do right now, but what? What can I do that can be of value in helping and instructing uh, the people?" Um, so he's written about that time during his first imprisonment. The book of Ephesians is one of my favorite epistles. Um, of course, I'm, my, my favorite epistle might be the one I'm studying at that moment in, in time sometimes. I mean, it's one that means the most to us. But the book of Ephesians is a book that describes the great spiritual blessings we have in Christ. So this is the book of Ephesians. Let me check my time here. We'll maybe spend more time than we need to on, on each epistle. But... Uh, not that we need to, then we have a lot to us at this point in time. The book of Ephesians is about Christ and the church. And I always remember the key verse in the book of Ephesians are two things. The first half of the book of Ephesians, which is chapters 1 through 3, what's the key verse in those chapters? Anybody know? Verse 3, chapter 1. Blessed be the God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, what? With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay. Every spiritual blessing we have is found where? It's found in Christ. Okay? It is found in Christ. And it enumerates those. We've been adopted. We've been made alive. Chapter 2. You that were dead and sin, you, he's, made, he's made alive. You were separated, but now you have been reconciled. Chapter 2 describes the condition without Christ. Get back over here. My boys get back. The camera only goes so far. I have to tie myself down. But anyway, we, we, we get the, 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 the point that all these spiritual blessings, the reconciliation. What about you and I as Gentiles before Christ came? We had no hope. You know, you were without hope, without God, and Lord, but now in Christ Jesus, you that were what? Afar off have been made near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2, that's 12 and 13, I believe, is where that is that's found. So chapters 1 through 3 say what? You've been blessed in Christ Jesus. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 say what? Live like a Christian. I think it's well in the morning. This is the outline. I always remember all the book of Ephesians besides the one that, that I've done. But this one, I need to stick out beyond mine. Chapters 1 through 3, I made you Christians. Chapters 4 through 6, what? Now I find. That's really what the book of Ephesians is at. Therefore, chapter 4 says, let us walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. If, if we're that blessed, God expects us to live a certain way. Live that way. Chapter 4, live different than the world. That means we, we, we control our tongue. It means that we're not bitter toward one another. It means we're forgiving. We're tenderhearted. Uh, there are things that should be named among Christians in chapter 5. Our relationships. Our relationship to Christ is one of complete submissiveness. I always remember this. In Ephesians 5, when he talks about uh, the marriage relationship, I think our tendency is, my tendency is, to go to that passage and immediately I think about marriage, okay? And I make application about marriage. And that's, that's wonderful. We need to do that. I've never talked to a husband or a wife, a married or counsel. We didn't end up in Ephesians 5 at some point in time. But Paul said, this is a great mystery, but I speak what? Concerning Christ and the church. The primary point Paul's trying to get us to appreciate that is not about the husband-wife relationship, but he's using that as an illustration of our relationship to Christ. Christ loved us so much that he gave himself up for us. Therefore, we must what? Submit to and serve him. That's the point. Now, do we learn something about husbands and wives in that past? And part of walking worthy is being a good husband and a good wife. Being a good child in chapter 6. And putting on the whole armor of God. 
He reminds the Ephesians at the end, you need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His life. God's given us all the armor we need to withstand in the evil day. You know, sometimes we, we worry about you know, the world we live in and everything that's going on and how, how much the devil's out to get us all. Keep this in mind. God gave you everything you need to win the battle. Okay? He gave you the armor you need. We're, we're not under armed. We have everything we need. If we'll just what? Use it. Well, just you put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. Colossians. What's Colossians about? Colossians is about the preeminence of Christ. So a good key verse would be what? Verse 18 of chapter 1. Colossians 1 and verse 18, He is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. And so that's really the message of the book of Colossians. Um, it may have been dealing with Gnosticism in its inseparate form. And what I mean by that, Gnosticism itself did not become full-blown in many years later. But the seeds of the doctrine that would grow into Gnosticism were planted many, many years before. And there are many that believe that, that really what Paul warns about in uh, Colossians, particularly in chapter 2, when he tells them to beware of false teachers, is about Gnosticism in that seed form, with the, the beginning points just starting to permeate. So, here's what you remember in, in Colossians. Chapter 1, the preeminence of Christ. If you compare Christ to anything, what, what, how does it come out? What does preeminent mean? First. First. Some translations just read that, that he might be first in everything. And, and I like that translation. He needs to be what? Number one. It, what if you compare him to the creation? Well, he created it. If you compare him to, uh, to us, he's the sacrifice uh, for us. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead uh, bodily. And Paul says, don't let anybody persuade you to, to quit following Christ. That's what chapter 2 is about. You know, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and through empty deceit, the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Don't let people draw you away from the Lord, for in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. And it seems at least some of this false doctrine had a Jewish flavor to it, because it warns about circumcision and the Sabbath day and things such as that. So then in chapter 3, he tells them to live as a new man. If you're going to be a Christian, what do you got to put off? You've got to put off the old man. What's the old man? The old man of sin. Things like fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, uh, all of these things bring God's right. Got to get rid of Got to get rid of it. But it's not enough to get rid of things. We've also got to what? Put on the new man. There, there are people I know that don't have, that, that put off some of the qualities of the old man. And they're not adulterers, they're not thieves. They're, they never have what? Put on the new man. The tenderheartedness, the, the, uh, the compassion, the, the meekness, the long suffering, the forgiveness. It's not enough to take off. We've also got to what? Put on. And above all those qualities, love, and then let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. He talks about our duties in the home, the duties toward masters in chapter 4 as he wraps up that epistle. Uh, what, what book, other epistle of the Apostle Paul, has a lot of parallel passages to Colossians? Ephesians. Now, here, here's one thing I can do. Of course, you just have to do this by mind. I've got computer programs that pull up parallels now, and, and they help a lot. What, what do parallels do for us? Well, parallels help us sometimes to explain things. And that's why I, I, you always need to remember Ephesians and Colossians together. Let me give you a couple examples of that. The book of Ephesians says that we need to not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay? That's in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 9. He's speaking to one another in Psalms, and again, the Spirit Psalms, and then he goes into the being filled with the Spirit. Go over to Colossians. Colossians says that we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing in grace in your hearts to the Lord. But right prior to that, instruction, where in Ephesians he said, be filled with the Spirit, Colossians says, let what? The Word of Christ dwell in you. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? 
It means we have the word of Christ well in you, rich. Okay? That's what it means. Uh, what about over in the book of Ephesians where it says, Children, obey your parents, for this is please, Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. What does it mean, provoke my children to wrath? Well, I'll go to Colossians' account, and it says, Fathers, provoke not your children, lest they become what? Discouraged. Children, so provoke my children to wrath. It means to act in such a way that it leaves my children exasperated and discouraged and not really know what's expected. So a lot of times when you have a parallel passage from Ephesians to Colossians, one of them helps to clarify or expound on, on the other. Any comments on that? Philemon, first imprisonment, 62 63 AD. It's a short epistle. It's one of the Apostle Paul's epistles written to an individual. Who is Philemon? He is a Christian who is a slave owner. What's his slave name? Onesimus. Onesimus, um, Onesimus has run away. He's a runaway slave. And when he ran away, who did he run into? The Apostle Paul. You ever heard somebody say it's what? It's a small world, right? It's a small world. Philemon, it shows that. I mean, Philemon, whom the Apostle Paul has known, has apparently converted to the Lord, apparently converted Philemon. Now his slave has run away, and now he runs to the Apostle Paul. Guess what happens to Onesimus? He's converted. And what the Apostle Paul does is he writes back to Philemon and tells him what? Well, first of all, he sends Onesimus back and says what? You've obeyed the gospel, now what? you got to go back. And he goes back with this epistle to Philemon and he tells Philemon, you know, who knows? It may have been providence that caused Onesimus to leave that you might have lost him for a little while but you might gain him forever. But outside of that, he said, I, I think he's a great service to me. I could tell you what to do, but instead what? I'm pleading with you. What? You know, basically, let him, let him go and be of service uh, to me. And so, Philemon, by the way, like, likely was a member of the church at where? Colossae. The International Colossae chapter 4. So that, that's a, a short epistle. Well, there's one chapter uh, epistle. Philippians. Philippians, the first in Christmas, 63 AD from Rome, Church of Philippi. What's the, what is the book of Philippians is about? Joy. Joy, joy is an under, uh, underwriting prayer. A lot of people say that the book is about joy. I remember it this way. It is about our commitment to Christ. What grows out of our commitment to Christ? Joy. Joy. Uh, and so, chapter 1, chapter 1 of the book of Philippians, Christ is our life. Paul said for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Chapter 2, Christ is our example. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, Christ is our hope. We don't hope in the flesh, but we hope in Christ Jesus. And in chapter 4, Christ is our strength and our sufficiency. I can do what? All things through Christ that strengthens me. So, just remember that. Chapter 1, Christ is our life. Chapter 2, He is our hope. Chapter uh, 3, or, or chapter 2, He is our example. Chapter 3, He is our hope. Chapter 4, He is our strength and our sufficiency. Uh, one of the things that, that I do appreciate about the Apostle Paul Greg said that joy is one of the underwriting things. You know, whenever you struggle to find joy in life, I want you to think about the Apostle Paul in prison. Writing a book of Philippians and telling everybody else to what? Rejoice! I mean, you think about what Paul was saying. He's in prison. Now, notice he's in prison. He writes in chapter uh, 2 about people, or chapter 1 about people trying to add affliction to his chain. He got brethren that aren't treating him in the right way, and they're taking advantage of his imprisonment to try to uh, inflict harm upon him. You think about all Paul's doing. Paul says, well, I've got a lot to be happy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. I don't care what circumstance we find ourselves in. We're in the midst of a pandemic. I don't care if we're in the midst of, of, of some other kind of loss. Rather, we've got a whole lot to be joyful about. And we ought to be joyful about it. That's what the Apostle Paul said about the Philippians. Because we have got those blessings in Christ. And, 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 and when we trust in Christ, and we put our faith in Him, and we let the peace of God that surpass all understanding, what? Guard our hearts and minds. Then we can have joy in difficult 
circumstances. So keep in mind when you get that epistle of joy, Paul's in prison when he writes that. And he still found a lot to be joyful about. First Timothy. When's first Timothy written? Well, it's after Acts. Somewhere a couple of years right after the book of Acts is written. Um, I have my dates, by the way, they're a little bit different than he does in the book. And the reason I put it, it is very difficult to be specific and say, Paul wrote that in right there. Okay. So a lot of times there's ranges given. I try to, uh, to go to his as much as I can just because that's what you got in hand. Uh, sometimes, by the way, I've got charts that, that put these things as much as 10 years different than what uh, these dates are. The buggy go back and harvest the dates events. But these, give it, these, event, these dates are pretty close. And so the best thing to say about 1 Timothy is uh, it is written somewhere around 63 uh, and 64 AD from Macedonia to the young preacher Timothy. And it's written to talk to him about how one ought to behave in the house of God. Key verse. Oh, by the way, let me just say this. There's not a right or wrong answer to that. It's not like the Bible. You get the Bible and it says, okay, this is the key verse. So, uh, I said there's not a right or wrong answer to that. There could be a wrong answer to that. Okay. I mean, you could give a verse that's completely disconnected from what the message is. But when I say there's a key verse, sometimes it's a choice to be made between a couple of verses here and there. You know, there's a difference in my favorite verse and the key verse too, Okay. But I think a good key verse, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, is where the Apostle Paul says, But if I am delayed, I write to you that you may know how you ought to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. You know why I think that's a good thing, a good key verse? The Apostle Paul says, Here's why I'm writing. Okay? If Paul says, Here's why I'm writing, guess what? Here's why he's writing. Okay? So he's writing to talk about how to behave what? In the house of God. He gives Timothy instruction that he needs to teach others. When we talk about the house of God, what he's talking about is as a family member of God, God expects us to live in a certain way. He expects us not to teach any doctrine besides his doctrine, chapter 1. He expects us to, to pray and conduct ourselves in a godly manner in chapter 2. He gives the qualification to church leaders in chapter 3, one of the texts that we have. And he warns in chapter 4 about... Um, apostasy that's going to come and give some Timothy and some instruction as to how to behave in the light of that to give himself entirely to use him as a talent. Chapter 5, he talks about how we treat other members in the body of Christ. Um, and, and, and though these are typically identified as, in, in denominational material, the pastoral business. And, and that's based on the concept that a preacher is a, a pastor. They're really preacher uh, epistles. They're written in the preachers. But we missed something that was okay. Here's something that applies only to preachers. Is there a lot of preachers to learn in that? Yes. Every preacher program I've ever seen, anybody conduct, you have to go through first and second Timothy over and over and over again, Titus over and over again. But there's a lot of other lessons we learn in that. In other words, he tells Timothy how to treat members of the body of Christ. It applies to preachers, but it applies to others as well. For example, when you're dealing with older members in the body of Christ, what? Treat them like a father. Don't rebuke an older man. Uh, but exhort him as a father. That doesn't mean rebuke, he doesn't mean you never point a sin out, but it means I don't talk to him like I would somebody that's younger. He's older than I am. So I, I approach him with the respect that's due to one that's older. Older women are the younger member, uh, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger as sisters with all purity. In other words, I treat the younger women like I would treat my sister. A lot of preachers would save themselves a lot of trouble with it that passage, you know, in terms of morality and other other issues. In other words, treat somebody like you would treat your sister, how do you have somebody else treat your sister? In all purity. What about widows? Well, you know, he deals with widows. If you've got widows, take care of them. If, if the widow does not have anybody else, then the church can what? Can help as long as she meets those qualifications that are listed above 60 years of age. Uh, give elders the honor that's due to them. Then in chapter 6, he talks about the warning about false teachers and the love of money. Titus is written after Acts. Who is Titus? He's another young preacher. What kind of, what's his nationality? He's Greek. He's the one, uh, by the way, we don't read about him in the book of Acts at all. In the book of Acts, he's never mentioned. Uh, but we do read about him in other Galatians chapter 2 where Paul comes to Jerusalem and says, I refuse to have him what? Circumcised. So he is a, he's a, he's a, he's a man that's trustworthy. 
He's a man that Paul uh, has trusted with great responsibility. Uh, what, what, what great responsibility do you remember him entrusting the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul trusting Titus with? Uh, one of them, anyway. Okay, appointing elders. He did trust him to appoint the elders at uh, at Corinth. Who delivered the letter of 1 Corinthians and brought word back about their response? It was Titus. And Titus likely was one of those that had uh, uh, taken the contribution from the needy saints uh, from Corinth and helped to deliver it. And he's a man that Paul put great trust in. What's the message of Titus? That was number one, right? We got we got plenty of time to finish these nice two. Titus, what's the theme of Titus? Sound in the faith. Uh, do a quick search, highlight all the, the, the things about being sound in the faith. Uh, remember this, chapter 1, protecting the sound faith. When you go to that section about elders, why does God put elders in the Lord's church? For one reason, I mean, maybe more than one reason, but in that text, why? For protection. That they may stop the mouth of the gainsayer. So chapter 1 is about protecting the sound faith. Chapter 2 is about, and the book of Titus is about the sound faith applying to all old men, older women, younger men, younger women, uh, old men, old women, young women, younger men, servants. It applies to everybody. It talks about our responsibilities uh, through chapter uh, 2. Chapter 3 talks about duties of a sound faith. So protecting the sound faith, sound faith applies to all and duties of a sound faith. Right. Titus, along with Timothy, give us a complete list of, of elder qualifications. And then the last writing of the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy. Uh, it's written during his second imprisonment somewhere around AD 67. Why is Paul writing to Timothy? 2 Timothy. He's telling to be an unashamed worker. What's your good key verse then? 2 Timothy chapter. 2 and verse 15. Be diligent, present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's about being an unashamed worker. And Paul writes this last epistle to him. Don't be ashamed of my teaching. Chapter 1. Uh, chapter 3, again, or chapter 2, the unashamed worker. Chapter 3, perilous times, difficult times are coming. Remember God's word that change. Hold on to it. And then chapter 4, just what? Preach the word. Preach where they like it, preach where they don't. There's going to come a time people are not going to want what you're, what, you're, what you're teaching. Keep teaching it anyway. One of the things about Paul in 2 Timothy that, might, that, that sort of stands out in my mind, a couple things about that epistle. Number one is the fact that the Apostle Paul in writing as he's on death row is not concerned about himself at all. Who's he concerned about? Timothy. Timothy. Um, you know, Timothy has been his right-hand man. He's been his son in the faith. But, you know, I, I think like, like any parent-child relationship, a parent is sort of concerned that sort of relationship they have. What's going to happen when what? When I'm gone? What's going to happen when I'm not there anymore? Who are they going to turn to? Who are they going to befriend? And so uh, he, he's writing to Timothy and telling him, stay the course. Don't allow what's happening to me, what? To throw you off. Okay? Stay faithful. That's really what he's writing to Timothy more. And, and, and the other thing that stands out in my mind is second is Paul's confidence that he has. That, that I'd like to have when I get to that. Chapter 1, when Paul says, you know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. You know, it's all like he's saying, I'm not, I'm not really worried. You know, Timothy, hold fast to that good thing that has been uh, committed to you. In fact, some of my favorite verses, verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day, or against that day. Go King James verse. Isn't that song we sing, I know not why God's wondrous grace? Uh, it's an old song we don't sing much, but it's based on that. Paul said, listen, I know who I put my trust in. I've got complete confidence that God is going to do what God said he was going to do. The other key verses that we can sort of help remember are other important verses. 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 7, I fall the good fight, I finish the course, I've kept the faith. If you go back to the previous verse, I'm already being poured out to bring Paul from the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. And he goes on to say, Henceforth there's laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me on that day, and not to me only. 
but to all those who have loved his appearing. And it's really like he's telling the, the, the young preacher Timothy, I've got a reward, but you know what? You can have it too. It's not just for me, it's for all those that have loved his appearing. So keep going, stay the course, don't give up, and look forward to the Lord's coming. Well, that's the 13 epistles of the Apostle Paul. So that gives us how many what? Eight? So we can spend a lot more time on Wednesday night going through those general epistles of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 1st, 2nd Peter, Hebrews, James, and Jude, and then we'll do that on, on Wednesday night.